I think I'll get started then. Um, hi everyone, my name's Jane Wagstaff. I'm a support scientist here at the LMB in our LMR facility. So I'm going to hopefully spend the next 50 minutes talking to you about advanced applications of NMR. So give you an idea of some of the projects we've done in the uh, in our facility in the recent years. Um, just and just while I'm talking, just have a think about your projects that you'll be doing, and how NMR might be able to help you understand um, your biological problems. So um, just to start then. Um, I know Trevor showed you guys this on his um, introduction talk on Tuesday, but just to can just to say again, you know, our uh, NMR facility is not in the main LMB building. We're in our own purpose-built building. It's about a ten-minute walk from the LMB um, by Car Park One. And if you think you would like to talk to us about a potential NMR project, could you please contact Stefan Freund? He's our head of the facility and our contact details are on our internal web pages. So how can NMR help you with your projects? Um, let's have a, a quick summary of, of NMR and, and what we can do to help. So I'm mostly going to be talking to you today about protein NMR. We do study um, small molecule NMR, we do do nucleic acids, but really our main focus is on protein NMR. And depending on the size of the sample will depend on the kind of information we can give you. So ranging from small peptides, 10 kilodons, even up to um, really quite large complexes. Recently, we had a sample in one of our magnets that was a megadalton complex looking at interactions. So there's a really, there's quite a wide range of, um, of uh, molecular weight that we can look at, but the information that we can give you will vary depending on the size. NMR is really powerful because we can get residue specific information about your sample. So for each backbone NH, for each amino acid that has a backbone NH, so not protein, we get a peak in our HSQC and that can tell us um, site specific information about what's happening within your protein. Encoded within our chemical shifts is information about the secondary structure element each residue is in. So even without pursuing a formal secondary structure, a traditional NMR solution structure, we can tell you about the secondary structure elements within your protein. We can tell you about the fold of your protein. Um, NMR is actually quite powerful at looking at interactions of your protein. So protein-protein interactions, protein-small molecule interactions. We can actually access quite a wide, a wide range of binding um, KDs. So it could be quite tight, could be quite weak interactions, and we can access that with our NMR experiments. We don't just see one static snapshot of your protein. Um, NMR can see different dynamic processes that are happening within your sample. So that might be a protein folding event that's happening on the seconds to minutes time scale, or you might have domain domain um, into the main motions that might be happening on the micro to millisecond time scale, or even side chain motion that's happening on the picosecond time scale. So NMR can access a really wide range of time scales of motion. Finally, um, just to say that NMR is a really complementary technique. It really sits on the interface between structural characterization by crystallography and EM and other biophysical techniques. So we can we are really a, a, an integrated structural biology technique. We can tell you about molecular motions, um, crystal structure optimization, really a very complementary technique. So this is just a quick summary of what I'll be talking to you today about. So uh, first I'm going to talk to you about samples, the things that we like to see in a sample. Then I'll be covering some slides on protein dynamics, which I've said is a really strong feature of our NMR experiments. And then I'm going to talk you through two examples of projects that we've had um, within the facility in the last few years. And they have quite a lot of NMR data in it, just to give you an idea of how we can add value to uh, a structural characterization project. So let's start with some samples. So um, if you've got a, quite a small protein, like maybe a peptide, 10 kilodaltons, um, 
we could do a full three dimensional structure if you wanted to, that we could do a dynamics analysis. You, if it was a peptide that you couldn't express recombinantly and you had it chemically synthesized, we wouldn't even necessarily want it to be isotopically enriched. We can, we can study it um, with just a, a synthesized peptide. The larger the protein gets, the more complicated the experiments we need to collect. Um, we, would, we would then need you to isotopically enrich your protein, um, even perhaps deuterate the protein. We could, you know, we wouldn't necessarily suggest that we would do a formal solution structure, although we could, but we could certainly tell you about the fold. We could look at um, its dynamic properties. We could look at interaction studies. Um, really, and um, there's really quite a lot we can do of for samples around this size. But as I've already said, if you have a larger system, it doesn't mean we can't study it by NMR. Um, we just have to have a different approach. So instead of looking at the whole protein, we might look at, say, um, there might be parts of the protein that have flexible regions and IDP flexible loops that we could study. We would need to think about different labeling strategies, maybe specifically label amino acid types or specifically label uh, methyl side chains. Um, so really, there's really, there is really things that we can look at with systems of this size, but what we'll be looking at is a complete picture for our smaller proteins and site-specific information for our larger folded proteins. And I say folded proteins, we have found that um, more recently within our facility that people wanting to study IDPs more by NMR, um, which is really the only way you could understand, we could get some really interesting structural inf um, information about IDPs because although you know they have don't really have much structure there are um, IDPs that have part residual structure that we can study by NMR and of course you know this is a this is one snapshot of what an IDP might look like but then of course we know that um, these IDPs have regions of great flexibility. So in this NMR ensemble, you can see this is kind of the motion that you would see within a disordered protein, and we can get a, a handle on that by NMR. The molecular weights of IDPs, were, um, uh, IDPs of up to 40 kilodaltons have been studied by NMR. We can look at dynamics, interactions, say if there was some area of residual structure that would then go on to take part in some kind of interaction study, then that's something that we can we could do, we could monitor by NMR. The experiments, 2D and 3D experiments, and even uh, different ways of collecting the data, which are called carbon detect um, over our more traditional proton detect experiments. And um, these IDPs would need to be double labeled with a nitrogen and, and 13C carbon. But um, in our experience, deuteration of these IDPs isn't, doesn't actually have much benefit. So again, something for you to think about in your projects. What kind of samples um, do we need? How's the sample preparation done? Well, we would ideally want you to um, express your proteins in minimal media. You can get that made for you by the kitchens here at the LMB. You would then supplement your minimal media with 15 ammonium chloride as your sole nitrogen source. Um, if it was double labeled, then you'd add 13C glucose or even deuterated 13C glucose and make your, min, make your minimal, minimal media with D2O so that you could replace all of your protons with deuterons. For our data collection, ideally we would like from you a 550 microliter sample of around 100 to 500 micromolar in aqueous buffer if you can't do that, then we can have lower volumes, we can have lower concentrations, but that would be our ideal. It would be in, uh, have a mid-range pH, but obviously that would depend on the PI of the protein. And we can, I think it's really worthwhile spending some time at the beginning of the project, looking at different buffer conditions to really optimize the sample for data collection. And then finally, we add 5% um, by, by volume deuterated D2O, and that's so we can make our NMR experiments work. So I want to talk to you a bit about protein dynamics. Now, I know Trevor showed you this slide in his talk on Tuesday, so I won't spend too long talking about it, but just 
you know, NMR can see the dynamic processes that are happening in your sample, be it protein folding, you might have domain, domain motion. These things are happening on what we call the slow time scale. So um, micro to um, millisecond or even up to the second time scale. And there are a number of uh, experiments that we can, we can use to probe this motion. We call it slow, that's slow relative to this term tau c. Tau c is the amount of time it takes your protein to tumble through one radian. Then we have motions that are faster than that. These would be, say, side chain motions. They're happening on the picosecond time scale and they're fast motions. So we, we can use various different experiments to probe this, these different um, time scales of motion by NMR. Again, I mean, Trevor spoke about this in detail on Tuesday, so I won't labour on this point, but just to say again, you know, ask the question, why is NMR so good at studying the dynamic properties of your sample? Well, um, the signal is really that we get in our NMR experiments really governed by relaxation, um, the relaxation properties of the sample. And you can actually quantify that and relaxation through the peak intensity and the line shape of our signals. Why is relaxation so important? Well, it's actually been, why is this important? Why, is, why does this help? Well, it's actually been known since the 1940s when NMR was first developed as a technique that relaxation is related to the molecular motion that's happening within your sample. Let's think about something that might be happening um, within your protein sample that we can observe by NMR. So say you had an interconversion between two states and we were just looking at one signal, uh, one residue that was, uh, that was sampling these two, these two states. And depending on the time scale of this interconversion would depend on what we could see within the time scale of our, our NMR experiments. So if you had something that was very slow into conversion, then you would actually see those two individual states. So one, one residue might have two different states and we could see them within the sample. Then the NMR sees everything. If that interconversion will start to happen at faster speed, then you know we'd start to see the the um, the averaging of this of this event would start to see that in fact at one point we wouldn't be able to see those residues because the signals would become broader that we'd get coalescence of these two states in terms of a time scale of motion and that we would then if there was a very fast exchange we would just see the um, an average between these two states and just see one peak don't want you to worry about the maths at all of this but just to let you know um, and um, this is how NMR can see um, lots of different motions, lots of different timescales of motion that are happening in your sample. One of the most um, simplest um, relaxation experiments that we can collect on your protein sample is the heteronuclear NME. And it's the simplest because it, it just samples motion on one frequency, on one timescale. Here's a, uh, and that's the picosecond time scale. Here's a typical um, heteronuclear NOE plot, the way we would look at the data uh, with a heteronuclear NOE value plotted against the primary sequence. You can see here um, this protein has a structured C terminus and there's no structure in the N terminus. Where we have our structured region, you can see the heteronuclear NME values are around 0 0.7, 0 0.8. This is typical of what we would see for a structured protein, residues in the structured part of the protein. And then in our unstructured N terminus, you can see the heteronuclear NOEs, NOE values are lower, even negative, and that's typical for disordered proteins and, and flexible termini. You see the residues can even be negative. But what's interesting about this disordered part of the protein is that even within it, there are regions of um, the protein that have values that are positive, that they're, that they're higher. So we can see in, in this disordered part, there are regions of rigidity. And this is a really nice way of observing the dynamic properties of a disordered protein, as I said, on the picosecond time scale.
Two other typical NMR experiments that we do to look at protein relaxation are um, T1, longitudinal relaxation, and T2, transverse relaxation. Just to say again, these are more complicated because they um, look at more than one frequency of motion within the data. But the value of these experiments are longitudinal relaxation can tell us about the overall shape of a molecule. So you could distinguish between a fully isotropic protein um, fold or say a coil coil, which would have an elongated structure that would be read out within our T1 data. And as Trevor said on Tuesday, T2 data can tell you about the overall molecular weight, the overall size of our protein. A really useful way of looking at our T1 T and T2 data is on this plot of T2 against T1. And also on the plot are some, are some lines and they're derived from this lapari zabo model free analysis, which can be used to describe uh, motion of a model system where that protein has isotropic tumbling. So it's a, a fully spherical protein. Um, these red lines describe an order parameter of rigidity. So if your residue was at, at an order parameter of one, it would mean it would be completely rigid. And then the lower the ordered parameter, the more flexible the residue is. And these blue lines are describing the overall tumbling time. So our tau C, the amount of time it takes for the protein to tumble through um, one radian. And what we can see for our protein here, ubiquitin, is that the majority of the residues have a very similar location on our T1, T2 plot, which is telling us the bulk of the protein has very similar dynamic properties. It's, it's tumbling with the, on the same kind of time scale. There are um, a number of residues though that are away from the, from the bulk of the, of the protein. And we know that these are from flexible loops and flexible termini in the protein. So it's a really nice way of visualizing the relaxation properties of your sample. If we were to then look at the same kind of plot, but for a protein that's disordered, and here I'm showing data for alpha-synuclein, you can see a, here you don't have all of the residues neatly fitting together in, in one part of the plot. They're a lot more spread out. So you can see that actually the relaxation properties of alpha-synuclein, the way it's behaving in solution is really quite different to a folded protein. And you can see that on our order parameter that the um, the, 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 the protein is really quite flexible. So this is a, as I say, this is a really nice way of looking at your data, a really nice way of comparing the dynamic properties of different proteins. Just like to um, spend a minute to, sh to show you a, a recent use of dynamics um, with, that we have had within the facility. So this is with Chris Dows from the MODIS group in the university wing. They were really interested in um, determining a crystal structure of this particular protein taser. They couldn't get the protein to crystallize. So um, Chris made the, made the protein isotopically enriched and it was assigned, and then the dynamic properties were analyzed. And here I'm showing you the T2 data for the taser protein. And there's a region of the protein that has um, this very high T2 values. So we would say that this was in a disordered loop. And then what you can do is then truncate out this loop region. And that's what Chris did. And then he was then able to make a crystal structure of get crystal structure of his taser protein and this loop would be inserted around here. But this is a actually a really useful way of using dynamics to help with your crystal structure optimization. And so this is a taser protein with a part fold. So let me talk about, talk you through some examples of um, NMR projects we've had within the facility in the last few years. And I'm going to talk to you first about ubiquitination, about how we've used, um, we've been able to study its phosphorylation and looked at a novel conformer. And this is a, a project that was done with a number of PhD students within the commander lab before it was disbanded here at the LMB. And, you know, why is ubiquitin so interesting? Well, ubiquitin, ubiquitin is very con conserved, it's highly conserved, and it's used 
as a post-translational modification protein. Um, you can make different chains and different permutations of ubiquitin because it can be, the C-terminus of ubiquitin can be linked to another ubiquitin molecule through these different lysine residues, or it can even be linked at the, at the N-terminal methionine. So different chain types have different um, post-translational modification properties, which lead to different um, functions of ubiquitination. From an NMR point of view, we are very fortunate that ubiquitin has been used as a test sample in lots of NMR labs around the world, and it was, has been used for a lot of technique development. So ubiquitin has been really well studied, and so we know a lot of experiments work really well on ubiquitin. We're not looking at ubiquitin here from a um, technical development point of view, but really looking at um, biological questions to do with ubiquitin. So as I said, um, ubiquitin is a post-translational modification. We first, when we first started uh, working with the commander lab, we were looking at um, different chain, stru chain structures and chain recognition. Um, the different chain types are involved in endocytosis, um, immunity, DNA damage. But in this particular project I want to talk to you about today, we were, um, the commander lab were looking at um, the role of ubiquitin in mitophagy. And this was a, a project started with Toby in the commander lab. So mitophagy and ubiquitin. So um, when you have a healthy mitochondria, the um, kinase pink cycles in and out of the membrane. But if you have a depolarization event, pink becomes resident in the membrane. It then phosphorylates itself. It phosphorylates the um, E3 ligase parkin, it phosphorylates ubiquitin, then the surface of um, mitochondria gets ubiquitinated, which then targets this broken mitochondria for um, degradation by phagocytosis. The commander lab were interested in the phosphorylation of ubiquitin and um, in to do with mitophagy because this E3 ligase parkin mutations within it have been associated with early onset um, Parkinson's disease. And I'm just showing you here a structure of Parkin. Um, so as I've said already, Parkin is activated by pink by phosphorylating its UBL. A UBL is a ubiquitin-like domain, so essentially ubiquitin at the end terminus of Parkin here. And Parkin phosphorylates um, the UBL um, and Parkin can also phosphorylate ubiquitin and ubiquitin that's been phosphorylated can also activate Parkin by binding down here. And the, that phosphorylation happens at a particular serine, serine 65. And what Toby was really interested in seeing was what were the consequences of this phosphorylation event on ubiquitin. So that's where we came in to study this um, by NMR. I just want to refresh your memory about uh, protein fingerprint and what we would see in our typical NMR experiments. And again, I know Trevor spoke to you about this on Tuesday, so I won't spend too long talking about it, but really just to say that for each backbone NH in our protein, you get one peak, you don't get a peak for proline. And the peak shape, the the peak position and the peak shapes can tell us a lot about what's happening in our sample. So if you get a lot of dispersion in this proton dimension, then we know we have a well-folded protein. And then in the line shape can tell us whether we have um, different kinds of motion that are going on within the sample. And now let's have a think about what we might expect to see when we follow a phosphorylation event within our in, within the magnet. So here we have our NMR sample, we've got our 15 n labeled ubiquitin, we've got our kinase in there and everything it needs to, to phosphorylate the, the protein. And here is our target for phosphorylation, our serine 65. So over time what happens is here's our serine 65, then we start to see a peak appear for a phosphorylated peak. Our non-phosphorylated peak starts to disappear and the peak intensity of our phosphorylated peak gets higher. So we will gain an extra peak in the spectrum and then when that uh, unphosphorylated protein is completely phosphorylated, we would then be left with just one phosphorylated species. 
And because of the presence of the phosphate group on the serine, these um, residues now have a different um, chemical environment and that's read out in a different chemical shift, a different position in the spectrum. So here's our ubiquitin spectrum, here's our serine 65, where we know that um, the phosphorylation event will happen. So we can see what happens to this over the time course of our experiment. We can collect a spectrum every eight minutes or so, so we can see what happens um, during the phosphorylation of ubiquitin. So over time, we can now see that we've got new peaks coming up. The intensity of our serine 65 peak is starting to get smaller. When we get to the end of our, towards the end of our experiment, more changes, more peaks appearing, peaks disappearing. Then we get to the end of our time course, our serine 65 peak is completely gone. But interestingly, and, and we don't see, um, uh, we see a lot more peaks now than we expected. We don't see the 100 or so peaks of ubiquitin. We actually see 160 peaks. So this is a bit confusing. We're not seeing just phosphorylated ubiquitin, possibly. There's something else happening. And we can use our NMR experiments to try and work out what's going on. So here's just another way of showing you the data. Here's our wild type unphosphorylated ubiquitin. And here I'm showing our phosphorylated ubiquitin um, spectra can see that there's a subset of the phosphorylated peaks that are actually in a very similar location to our wild type peaks. So we know that, you know, all of the sample has been phosphorylated. So we could say with quite a high degree of confidence that the peaks that match up with the red peaks, the wild type of peaks are a phosphorylated wild type like ubiquitin species. But then there are the additional peaks that come up, they're in actually quite a distinct location. So there's obviously something different going on within these phosphorylated system. So because this phosphorylation event was done on a protein that was double labeled, we're able to assign the various phosphorylated peaks to find out, you know, what they belong to, what's happening in these peaks, in these, in this species. So in doing that, we could able to actually confirm that yes, that there were a subset of peaks that did um, match up with wild type like ubiquitin and these accounted for about 70% of the sample within the tube and they have a, a, a wild type like peak position. The remaining peaks could also be assigned to a ubiquitin sequence um, and that um, peak intensity told us it was about 30% of the phosphorylated ubiquitin in the sample, but they were really in quite a different peak location. So here's our, phosph here's our phosphorylated wild type serine 65. And then in our other species, the serine 65 is all the way over here. So there's really something quite different going on in this species. Here's just another way of showing you the data. So our phosphorylated species are in two different colors, two different blue colors now. And if we use our chemical shift perturbation maps to compare the peak locations, so wild type with our major phosphorylated species, you can see essentially what we'd expect, just relatively small changes around the um, phosphorylation location. But when we compare the wild type with our minor species, we can see actually really quite large chemical shifts, particularly in the C terms of the protein. And as you would expect, these, are, these shift differences are mirrored between the, the major and the minor phosphorylated species. So, as I've already said, um, that our NMR data has structural information encoded within the chemical shifts. So are there any structural differences in, in these two ubiquitin phosphorylated species? Well, if we compare the secondary structure elements in the crystal structure of ubiqu ubiquitin, we can see that in the major species and the crystal structure are really quite similar. The only real difference in the fold that we can see in the minor species is there seems to be an extension in the C-terminal C strand, seems to be slightly longer in this minor species. Toby wanted to structurally characterize this a bit further, so he crystallized the phosphorylated ubiquitin. And his normal ubiquitin on the left and the phosphorylated species on the right, and really the folds are identical, as I think our NMR data has showed. The only real difference is this patch of negative charge that we get from the phosphorylated serine. And there wasn't any evidence in the crystal structure to, to um, really show what this minor species is and what could be happening. 
So can we use our NMR, data, our NMR experiments to further characterize this minor species? So we looked at the dynamic properties. Here I'm showing this heteronuclear NOE plot again. The values for most of ubiquitin around 0.8. This is to be expected for a well-folded stable protein. The only real difference between the major and the minor conformation seems to be again in this very sea terminal region where the minor species looks to be a little bit more stable at the sea terminal strand than the minor species. So can we hypothesize what might be happening? We seem to have two slightly different conformations of ubiquitin and a major species that's more wild type like in this minor species. Could they be exchanging between each other because we didn't really see the we didn't see any evidence of this minor species in the crystal structure and we can look at that possibility by NMR again and that's using an experiment called ZZ exchange so it's this really like a typical NMR experiment a typical HSQ HSQC experiment the only real difference is it has a, a delay time built into it that allows magnetization to transfer between two exchanging species if they were exchanging. And then that would give us a cross peak and between the two species. And indeed, we do see these cross peaks. So we know that there is an interconversion of these two states, these two um, phosphorylated species. And if we alter the delay time, then we can fit that data and then work out an exchange rate. And we know that um, these two different conformations of ubiquitin are exchanging at a rate of about twice a second. So indeed, this confirms an, uh, an exchange between the major and the minor species. So can we work out what's happening? What's the difference between this major and minor species? One clue we did have is if you look at the the difference in peak location between so this Q62 for the for the wild type like species and its um, and the minor species, you can see there's a really big shift difference. They're in a really different part of the of the spectra, and that led us to um, think that this could be a change in the hydrogen bonding network that we're seeing within the sample. And we can actually study that by NMR. So um, one of the typical NMR experiments that we do when we're assigning our protein is this HNCO experiment and that correlates the, the backbone NH of a residue with its preceding residues carbonyl. And if you think about what's happening in a, a hydrogen bond, it's actually a really similar kind of bond, it's just happening over longer distances and similar kind of coupling. So we can study these hydrogen bond couplings with a modified HNCO experiment called a long range HNCO. Um, and that is a 3D experiment. So I'll just explain what, I'm, what you're seeing here. So in the red peaks, this is our HNCO experiment and it's showing us a correlation between the isoleucine 44 and the preceding leucine 43 carbonyl. And this is the proton dimension here. This is the carbon dimension going along the side. And as it's a 3D, we're looking at the slice through of the 15N dimension. So, so our red peak is our standard HNCO experiment. And then in blue, we have our long range HNCO. So looking through the hydrogen bond, so we can see now a correlation between isoleucine 44 and the carbonyl of histidine 68. So that's an expected hydrogen bond in wild type like ubiquitin. If we look at our minor species and the hydrogen bonds we can see here. So now instead we, got, we don't see a hydrogen bond from isoleucine 44 to histidine 68. We now see a correlation between isoleucine 44 and valine 70. So that hydrogen bond has shifted by um, two residues. If we look at all the hydrogen bonds within the two species, as I said before, you know, ubiquitin has been used as a test sample and these experiments were developed using um, ubiquitin. So we know what to expect in the long range HNCO from wild type ubiquitin. We see a very similar hydrogen bonding pattern in the major species. But in the minor species, you can see that the hydrogen bonds have shifted by two positions within this C terminal strand. So in fact, the strand has been retracted into the core of the, of the, of the ubiquitin 
and Toby was able to model that for us. And so here we have our phosphorylated ubiquitin structure with, an, with the C terminus here. And then we have the phosphorylated species where the, um, chip, where the C terminal strand has been retracted into the core of the protein. We now have this um, phosphorylated serine is an extended loop and the C terminal has been retracted. And this has been made possible by this leucine X leucine X leucine sequence that enables the strand to shift up into the core of the protein. And we were able to confirm this alternative um, structure, this CTAM retractor structure with more traditional NMR methods. I just want to take a minute to think about the solvent accessibility of your protein and indeed this ubiquitin species. So I marked here on the structures ubiquitin and the red parts are the labile um, uh, um, amide protons that are able to exchange freely with the solvent because their, their NHs are exposed, but not all of them can exchange freely with the solvent because they might be part of a hydrogen bond or they're buried within the core of the protein. So some protons are able to exchange and some are protected. And later on in these series of talks, you should hopefully be hearing about a um, a technique called hydrogen deuterium exchange um, mass spectrometry and in this is the same principle we can do the same thing by NMR. Just want to think about the time scales of what's happening so in HD exchange by NMR or mass spec then we're looking at maybe ligand binding events or conformational exchanges that are happening on the seconds to minutes time scale but when I talk about solvent exchange here in these experiments, we're actually talking about exchange on the millisecond time scale, and we can do this by NMR. And we can uh, we can actually fit the exchange regime, and we're looking at events that are happening between two and forty times a second. So this is really exchange in the millisecond time scale. So. If we do these experiments for our phosphorylated ubiquitin um, sample, here's our standard HSQC and our exchange experiments are called Kleenex. And if we then, so all the blue peaks are the um, back label um, protons that can exchange with the solvent. And we look at the differences between our major and minor species. You can see our wild type like species this Q62, which is part of the loop region where phosphorylation occurs, it can't really exchange with the solvent, but in the c term we retracted form where the loop is made, this residue can now exchange with the, with the solvent. The same is true for lysine 63 and um, 64 residue. So this is a really nice way of um, studying the, the different properties of this, of this exchanging um, species within one NMR sample with one NMR experiment. So we've been able to show um, with the commander lab that uh, this retracted form of um, ubiquitin is seen when ubiquitin is phosphorylated and we've been able to characterize the exchange rate. But what wasn't really known was whether this um, retracted conformation was a product of the phosphorylation or whether it's something that can happen to ubiquitin without the presence of phosphorylation. What we do know is that if it did happen, then the, um, the retracted form must be in a very low population because as I said, um, the ubiquitin has been very well studied um, structurally by NMR because it's used as a test sample to develop different um, NMR experiments. So we know that it would have to be in a, a very small species if it was exchanging, if it did happen at all. Now, actually, there are experiments that we can use to access this kind of exchange regime, and they are called CEST, which means chemical exchange saturation transfer, which is actually a technique that was first developed within the MRI field. We've been using it now in solution NMR. You need to have certain, um, you need to have certain um, things for this experiment to work. So you need to have a certain exchange regime. Um, the, the main population must be quite large and the invisible population quite small. And then the two different populations must have unique chemical shifts for us to, to see if this experiment will work. And how does it work? Well, 
a saturation pulse is applied to our uh, sample and saturation pulses reduce signal intensity. So here we have our Q62 peak. Um, if we were to apply a saturation pulse at this nitrogen frequency, then we would reduce the signal intensity of that peak. If this peak was exchanging between its invisible state at a certain location, say here, and then we were to apply our saturation um, to the invisible state, then we and then there's an exchange process between the two states, then that would be read out in a reduction in signal intensity on our visible Q62 peak. So we would sweep through with our saturation transfer and then look to see what effect that had on the intensity of our Q62 peak. So as we would hit our Q62, we would saturate the signal and it would become smaller. But then also as we would hit the invisible state, we would also see a change in the peak intensity. So this is what happens in our data for our phosphorylated ubiquitin, here, oh, sorry, not our phosphorylated ubiquitin, our wild type ubiquitin, here's our Q62. This is a pseudo 3D experiment, so we have our 2D and then encoded within a third dimension is the swept 15N saturation pulse. Then let's see what happens to our Q62. So here we, we see our dip when the saturation hits our known peak location. Then as we sweep through the different um, frequencies of the 15N dimension, we see a second dip. So this is from our invisible species. So indeed, there is an invisible confirmation of ubiquitin. We don't normally visualize this data like this. We normally plot it as a reciprocal, so a change in peak intensity. And we can fit this data and work out the exchange rate and the population and we were able to show that about 0.7% of this ubiquitin sample has a, is a minor species and it's exchanging about 60 times a second. So the question really is why has this not been seen before? Well ubiquitin um, has been studied with CEST experiments before and the real difference and the reason we can see it this time when it hasn't been seen before is temperature because if you collect this um, data at 25 degrees, which you would normally collect your ubiquitin spectra at 25 degrees, nine times out of 10, you actually can't see a second state. But as you raise the temperature, you start to see a shift in the equilibrium and you and towards the minor species. And at 45 degrees, you can see them and fit the data for the minor species. We knew this might be the case because when we have our phosphorylated ubiquitin and if we raise the temperature, we do shift the equilibrium towards the minor species. So um, are we seeing the same retractive confirmation? Well, we can compare our peak locations of phosphorylated ubiquitin with our wild type CES data. And we can see there are similarities in the peaks. They're not identical and we wouldn't want them to be identical because um, this species is phosphorylated and this is wild type, so it has different chemical environments. But you know, essentially we think we're seeing this, a similar retractive confirmation. And we've really confirmed this by looking at the absolute shift differences between the um, phosphorylated ubiquitin and our CES data, and we are seeing the retracted confirmation. Now, um, Christina and Alex, who were the PhD students on this part of the project, they were, they were able to produce mutants of ubiquitin that um, really emulated what's happening in the phosphorylated ubiquitin without the presence of phosphorylation. So they have a mutant, this TVLL mutant with mutations around the phosphorylation site, which make the, um, well, the unphosphorylated ubiquitin have this minor confirmation structure. And then this wild type lock mutation where the phosphorylated ubiquitin doesn't adopt the minor confirmation, it looks like wild type. And then as we did with Toby, we were able to measure phosphorylation time courses to see whether um, these mutants were phosphorylated at any different rates compared to wild type. And here you can see, here's our wild type phosphorylation um, data. And then for our, um, well, the wild type lock mutant is phosphorylated much slower than wild type. And then our TVLN, our, wild, our um, retracted 
confirmation ubiquitin is phosphorylated much faster. So it seems that this retracted confirmation of ubiquitin is required for official, efficient phosphorylation of ubiquitin by pink. And Alex took this one step further by taking the TVLN mutant ubiquitin and using a nanobody was able to crystallize the kinase pink. And you can see that the active site of pink is only reached by ubiquitin by um, if the um, C terminus is retracted and this loop is extended in order for the phosphorylation of ubiquitin to occur. So to summarise that, I mean, we've been able to show that um, in situ phosphorylation of a sample by NMR, we were able to characterise the exchange rates between the two forms of phosphorylated ubiquitin. We were able to do this by NMR and the um, structural characterization wasn't possible by crystallography. We've also been able to identify um, and quantify an invisible confirmation of ubiquitin by NMR and then show that this retracted confirmation is required for efficient phosphorylation by pink. Just in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about this project. Uh, another project that we've had in the lab this time is looking at modeling a membrane associated protein um, and this protein um, is a study that we have carried out with a medic, Rhys Roberts, who was at the CIMR, he's also a neurologist working at Addenbrooke's and he's really interested in this um, charcot marie tooth disease and its associated protein litaf. Now, CMT is an uh, inherited neuromuscular disorder. It doesn't affect your life expectancy, but it does affect your peripheral nerves. So this ends up in a loss of sensation, tendon shortening, muscle weakness in your hands, your feet, your forearms, and your lower legs. And it was first described in the late 1800s by these gentlemen. The CMT is actually an umbrella term for uh, a large number of mutations that um, happen in genes that are related to, uh, that end up with axon and myelin sheath damage in the peripheral, peripheral nerves. And these mutations could be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. And Reese is particularly interested in, in CMT1C which is mutations in the protein LITAF. And what was known about LITAF at the beginning of this project? So LITAF, it stands for lipid polysaccharide induced tumor necrosis factor alpha factor, also known as SIMPLE, 17 kilodaltons, but it could form a higher order complex. It's associated with the endosome in cells. It has an N-terminal polyprotein rich unstructured domain and a C-terminal LITAF fold, which also contains a hydrophobic helix. And when we started this project, the topology of this membrane-associated protein was controversial in the literature. So Reese wanted to understand and really get to the bottom of the topology of LITAF. And he did that with this really elegant experiment where he took cells that didn't express the background of LITAF. He then transfected in the LITAF with um, that would have a tag on the N, T, C, N, and C terminus. So if your LITAF was associated with the endosomal membrane, then the tags would be on the outside of the endosome. But if it was C terminally inserted, then one of the tags would be on the inside of the endosome. And then knowing that we have different markers for the inside and the outside of the endosome, you can then permeate the membranes within the cells and then plot for the different tags and to see if we can look at the topology. And this is what we did. So if you just have a low level of digitonin to permeate the outside of the, of the cells, then if, you, if it was membrane associated, then you would see both tags. But if it was C-terminally um, inserted, then you would have to add more digitonin in order to probe for this um, C-terminal tag. And here are the results. So Reese was able to show that with only a low level of um, digitonin, he could see both tags. And, and at the higher level, then you start to see the lamp one for the inside of the endosome. So this showed that the LITAF was um, membrane associated. 
looking at the sequence alignments of LITAF, you can see these highly conserved cysteine residues indicated that LITAF would be metal binding, so in association with a lab in Oxford, micropixy analysis was carried out which showed that for each LITAF molecule there's one molecule of zinc, confirming that LITAF is indeed a zinc binding molecule. So um, Rees wanted to um, study the uh, structure of the LITAF domain, he tried to crystallise it but he wasn't able to crystallise it so he came to us to um, determine the, the structure of the folded LITAF domain and now I have to hold up our hands and say we try really hard to look at the native protein in a membrane background using membrane memetics but we were not able to get the, the system right, it's actually very challenging to look at membrane associated proteins. So as the system was membrane associated, we, the construct was made soluble by truncating out the, um, the, the hydrophobic helix and then just leaving a linker region just so we could look at the folded domain that we would see on the surface of the, of the LITAF. And that really helped us with the time constraints that we were under. And I'm showing you uh, HSQC of the LITAF protein, the soluble litter construct. And if we think about our protein fingerprint, here we have um, a region of peaks which are really close together. In the proton dimension, this, is, this goes to show this region is unstructured. But then we do have a subset of peaks with quite a broad proton dimension. And this is telling us that these are likely to be from our structured domain. So we completed the assignment and looked at the secondary structure elements and this confirmed indeed that there was an unstructured polyprotein N-terminus and then the C-terminus LITAF domain is a three strands, a three strand sheet N-terminal to this hydrophobic um, replaced linker and then we have a hairpin at the very C-terminus. I actually showed you this at the beginning. This was the heteronuclear NOE of LITAF. And you can see, again, you've got the um, high values of heteronoe for the structured part. And then we have our disordered polyprotein arm. But it has these regions of increased rigidity. Now, what's known about LITAF is it can bind the poly, um, it can bind the WW domains of NED4. And if you if you titrate in the WW domains of NED4 into our um, labelled sample, you start to see line broadening. So it's this, um, this annoying time scale where you, you can see that peaks start to disappear because of the, the binding event. But it did confirm that the WW domains do indeed bind to this polyprotein arm. They match up in the same regions of this increased rigidity. And again, Reese was able to confirm this binding by mutation analysis. So we wanted to build a, a structure of, um, of uh, LITAF using NMR. We didn't do a, pursue a formal solution structure. This time we used um, the Rosetta suite of protein mod modeling. And if we use a version called CS Rosetta, which can incorporate the chemical shift information, the secondary structure element information we can get um, by NMR, we can see our first attempt at a model. Um, here we are above our truncated protein. The, um, the very simple web server version of CS Rosetta, which is what we use to do this, can't cope with metal binding. We did an in-house model, uh, an in-house version of CS Rosetta, which you can then model in the, um, we can then model in the, the metal binding. And then also using um, Rosetta, we could then have a look at what that wild type protein might be like if it, with the um, hydrophobic helix also taken into account in the model. So you can see the helix would be sitting on the surface of the membrane here. Then we have our structured domain on top of the protein and then our polyprotein arm would be sticking out into solution. So we were not really because we were not able to study the um, protein in association with the, with the membrane, we could actually look at different membrane memetics. So look at the soluble protein and then look at, also look at soluble head groups to see how this protein would possibly interact at the enzyme surface. So here we have our soluble head groups and here we have our control protein and then we add in the head groups to see if we see any, any interaction. So we really see anything with phosphocholine we see 
quite a few changes as phosphorylethylolamine. We see some changes with phosphoglycerol, um, no real changes with phosphoglycerol, nothing really with phosphoserine. So we could say, oh, nothing really happening with IP6. So we could say that the um, lit uh, protein seems to interact with phosphoethanolamine. And if we look at our chemical shift perturbation map, you can see that the parts of the protein that interact with lit uh, with the head groups are in the um, structured fold, which is what we would expect. And so if we then, we can then build our model a bit more, in a bit more detail. So here's our hydrophobic helix, and these are the residues that we know interact with head groups. And then we can imagine our N terminal polyprotein arm sticking out into solution, looking for its binding partners. Now, Reese was really interested in the disease aspects of LITAF as well. And there are a number of um, patient mutations that have been identified in LITAF. Um, unfortunately, for our study, um, the majority of these patient mutations occur in the hydrophobic helix, but there was one patient mutation with it that we could study within our soluble protein. So in our first experiment, we simply compared the peak locations of the wild type um, soluble protein with the patient mutation soluble protein. And we can see that actually, uh, uh, perhaps unexpectedly, the um, mutation has quite a, a pervasive effect. It's not just localized to the mutation site. It can be seen across the, the secondary structure elements of the, of the lit fold. Um, and if we mark those onto our models, we can see that actually the residues that are affected by the mutation are similar to the residues that we saw interact with the phosphoethanol amine head group. So similar to the membrane interacting regions. So we could also study the interactions of um, the patient mutation with our soluble head groups. So this is just to refresh your memory, this is our wild type soluble protein in the presence of a low concentration of head group and the higher concentration of head group. And if we do the same with our patient mutation, you can see we get actually quite marked differences at this lower concentration of head group that we didn't see with our wild type like protein. And then when we go to the higher concentration of head group, we actually see some evidence of aggregation. So the way that this protein interacts with the head groups is different in the patient mutation. And if you look at an aggregation assay, you can see that um, unlike the wild type like protein, in the higher concentration of the head groups in the mutant protein, you start to see aggregation and the protein starts to fall out of the solution. And Reese was able to also study this within the cell. So in, um, he had cells that expressed the wild type LITAF and then um, halted protein expression by cyclohexamide. And you can see after 24 hours, the wild type like protein is quite stable within the cell, but the patient mutation protein starts to degrade quite quickly within the cell. So this is a, a really uh, interesting way of trying to understand how um, this patient mutation is interaction with the membrane is different, which might then lead to this um, CMT presentation within the, in the, within the patient. I think I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave these references here if you want to do any um, background reading into the projects I've talked about. Again, if you're interested at all in a project um, with us with NMR, please, please do get in contact. Okay, thanks, guys.